Welcome everybody to the first edition of Fox Day's Front End. Woo! So this has been quite an effort by Alex and Andra. And so before we continue, I would love for you to actually applaud their enthusiasm and their efforts for making this happen. You will probably not believe this, but this event actually cost them blood, tears, and sweat, uh, and even tears. So it, it is an emotional, an emotional ride to actually make this happen. Uh, it's a roller coaster of emotions because you go like, it's a first edition, they have no reference. Are there enough TypeScript or JavaScript developers you know, in Bucharest who are interested in this event? So it's always a risk, but it looks like it turns out well. I think you guys reached close to 250 people. So this is really great. Congratulations again. Um, they have two parallel tracks. Everything is going to be recorded and will be published on uh, the DevOx YouTube channel. Um, just so you know, the YouTube channel has more, more than 82,000 uh, subscribers. So for the speakers, even if you have only 100 people in your room, there's going to be thousands and thousands of people watching the, the session online as well. So as an attendee, you will not have to miss a single second. Alex. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we had uh, big emotions uh, with this event, uh, but uh, it turned out in the last weeks uh, we we uh, managed to gather a good uh, good audience, and uh, uh, we uh, were lucky to find the good speakers who have a, a good nice lineup. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, of Vox days. We started uh, in 2006. Uh, 2016, uh, not, uh, not that long, uh, and uh, usually this event was uh, uh, Java-based, uh, and I always tried to push um, a front-end track inside the conference. Um, so um, uh, we uh, we had um, this uh, kind of uh, split feedback uh, last year, and we decided to, to uh, separate the two events and create a conference specially for the front-end front-end people. Uh, and another one for uh, for backend people. Uh, so um, uh, I, I'm glad we have uh, so so much people interested in uh, in front end technologies, and uh, I hope this uh, it's uh, uh, beginning for a very nice uh, community of front end development in uh, in Bucharest. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Andra, it's uh, uh, saying I, I have to thank our speaker, our sponsors, for making this event possible and for believing in us and for believing we can uh, we can uh, create a nice conference and gather uh, uh, very talented people uh, that uh, are keen to learn and improve themselves uh, and uh, be there, be, be uh, the top uh, developers. Uh, to organize the organizatory things if you want to connect to Wi-Fi uh, on the back of your page it's a SSID and the password for, for the for the Wi-Fi network I hope it's uh, it's uh, good uh, it will be a good uh, speed we usually have good speeds in Romania so uh, that shouldn't be a problem uh, as Stefan said all the all the talks will be recorded so don't be sad if you miss one uh, you will uh, have the chance to to watch it later on YouTube and of course uh, please help us with uh, with feedback because we want to we want to uh, create a, a, a even greater event next year. So if you go here on the website, we have a schedule web app where where you can uh, where you can uh, uh, see uh, which talks you want to go. So maybe you can uh, you can even favorite uh, your your next talks. And please uh, give us feedback uh, for the talks you are attending, uh, and you will help us. Uh, 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 choose the best uh, the best talks, and you will choose, uh, you will help speakers uh, to improve their their talks. Uh, so I think uh, that's it. That's it from our part. Uh, has it. One question. So who's here for the, who's attending for the first time this Fox Days series? So who's here for the first time? Wow, a lot. Wow, great. <laughs> so you reached out quite a lot of people. And who has already attended the Fox Days? Just so few. And keep up your hands. Who have already attended the DevOx event? Yeah, a few people there as well. Good, great. Well, welcome back for the ones who are uh, attending multiple ones. So I think we're all set, right, and ready for the keynote speaker. Uh, we would like to introduce Simona Cotin, our first keynote speaker. So Simona, please yours. Thank you so much. Bună dimineața, dragilor. Numele meu este Simona Cotin și mă bucur 
extraordinar de mult, sunt super încântată să fiu aici. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult că ați ales să vă petreceți ziua alături de noi. După cum puteți observa, după accent, sunt din Iași, dar am fost și în București la un moment dat, am stat o perioadă foarte scurtă, deci împărțim aceeași zonă. Voi face switch la engleză, dar vă urez o zi absolut fantastică. Okay, so before we actually get started, I want all of us to give another round of applause for the organizer. There's one thing that they didn't mention, which is that they decided to organize this whole conference, which is a first edition for tons of people, lots of organizational stuff, and they decided to do this just before they get married. So now, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Andra and Alex. You are absolutely fantastic. All right. So we're in 2019. That is 30 years since the web was first invented or since anyone has ever thought of this idea of sharing resources over this common, uh, common, common place, which is the web. And as we get started, uh, the first thing that I want us to do is basically uh, step back and take, uh, take a look at what happened uh, in the 80s. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, which is now the creator of the web, um, he was working at CERN back then, and he was just like us, a software engineer. Um, and as he was working with different teams across CERN, uh, he often he found himself in this place where he had to share resources with all those different teams. And those teams were coming from different universities from all over the world. We know how important CERN is, um, and there was a ton of collaboration there. Um, and it wasn't as it is today where you have three different operating systems, which are the main operating systems. You have Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Uh, basically, at that time, a lot, of the, a lot of the software engineers and a lot of the researchers were bringing their own systems and their own operating systems uh, that would, there, where they would work on. Um, and for every single resource that they had, had to share among different uh, people and different teams, uh, they have to basically learn the, oper the new operating system. They had to um, write programs that would uh, take one resource from uh, a type of operating system and then convert it to a different one. Uh, there was a lot of manual steps there. Uh, and many times, instead of actually uh, going to one's computer and understanding where to get those, that information, uh, many times they use what is called today the coffee chit chat or the water cooler chit chat, something that we're very familiar with uh, today, which is uh, we meet each other and share the information virtual, uh, verbally as opposed to going through all this process of converting information from one system to another. Uh, but as every single software engineer out there that absolutely loves to automate its way out of a job, uh, Tim Berners-Lee decided that he, um, he wants to implement some form of system that will be able to process the, these resources in a unified way so that it can be shared across different uh, computers. And in March 1989, this is how he came up with this new proposal the information management a proposal. And this is what was the proposal that uh, created the web that we have today. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, with, as with every single innovative idea, uh, the feedback isn't always, um, yes, let's do this. In fact, most of the times we tend to say that if people tell you absolutely no to a certain idea, uh, it basically means that you're on to something. Right? <laughs> so uh, the feedback that Tim got from his manager, Mike, was this is vague, but kind of exciting. And that's, what, that's everything that Tim needed in order to uh, continue with this project. Um, and in, um, in, uh, in the 90s, uh, when in 1990, uh, when uh, Tim started working on the web, he basically created the three main components, which are um, HTML, the markup that we're using now to create resources on the web, 
uh, URI, uh, which identifies uniquely resources that we share across the web. Uh, and then HTTP, which is the protocol that allows us to share these resources and allows our computers to communicate using the exact same language. And this is the first image uh, this is the first web app that has been created. This is the first web app that Tim has published on the web. Um, as you can see, it's a collection of text and links, nothing more. Uh, but it was, it was a huge step for us. It was a huge leap into the future. And as, as the usage of, of these resources uh, and of these applications grew within CERN, uh, Tim realized that actually this is this would be much more useful um, and it would take, it would become much more powerful um, if it was free to use by anyone, anywhere. So that's when he decided, together with um, a couple of other colleagues of his, to go to the CERN committee and advocate for making the web royalty free and publishing the code um, for, for the web to happen. Um, had the technology been proprietary and in my total control, it would probably not have taken off. This is what Tim thought in 93. And soon after, he basically left CERN um, to join MIT and build this new uh, group, World Wide Web Consortium, also known as uh, V3C, um, with the goal to create standards for the, uh, for the open web. And to this day, he remains the director of V3C. And the, world, the, the early web community produced some revolutionary ideas that are now spreading far beyond the, the technology sector. So first of all, we're looking at uh, decentralization, which means that, uh, or refers to the fact that we don't have a, a kill switch for the web. There's no single entity and no single person that will ever be able to turn off the web. And that's great. That means that the power belongs to us, the users, um, and a huge community around the web and V3C. Uh, Non-discrimination. Uh, basically, if I pay to connect to a certain level of service um, and, I, and you do the same, even if you're in the same room as me or uh, you're in a completely, on a completely different continent, uh, if we pay for the exact same level of service, we're going to be able to communicate at the exact same level. Um, Bottom-up design, instead of code being written and controlled by a very small number uh, of experts, um, it was developed in, in public um, and uh, encouraging maximum participation from everyone that wanted to be part of this community. And this is very important because that means that anyone in this room could actually contribute to uh, V3C. Um, another important uh, concept in, or principle that V3C has is universality, uh, which refers that, uh, to the fact that everyone could publish documents to the web. Um, so we have this concept of being able to contribute to the actual web platform itself and create that, but we also have this concept of um, anyone that uses the web is able to create new resources and create content for the web itself. Uh, without having to pay for it, um, and regardless of the language that you're using or regardless of where in the world you're actually sitting. Um, and consensus refers to the fact that in order to have a standard, you need people to abide that standard and agree that we are all going to use this standard. These are wonderful principles to live by, right? Uh, the, the foundation for the web that we're using today was already um, really good. And there's a couple, so as the, the community uh, around um, the World Wide Web, um, V3C, um, started to work together, um, there's tons of initiatives that have started. Um, and I, I highly recommend you go check out the, the website. How many of you have, have ever gone to V3C website? Okay, so that's probably half of the room. That's wonderful. I'm very happy to see that. For the rest of you, definitely go check out the, the web page. There's a lot of initiatives there, uh, there and a lot of directions over how to uh, become better contributors to the web. Um, two of them that I'm, I'm super passionate about um, are Web for All 
and web, web on everything. And web for all uh, refers to creating content and creating a web that is accessible and is uh, usable for everyone no matter where, where they are. And web on everything uh, refers to the ability to, to, to consume content from any type of device out there. So let's focus for a second on web for all. And the first thing that I want us to look at is, I, I need to pronounce this slowly in my mind first and then <laughs> out loud, internationalization. It's also now known as I-18N, and that's basically the first letter, the number of letters in between, and then the last letter. So internationalization, that wasn't as good. <clears throat> um, I was, last month I was at my, I was speaking at the very first conference in Romania uh, ever, which was JS Heroes. Uh, and there was this wonderful talk by, by Chen. She talked about typography um, and ways we can create content in a way that it can be consumed from, from different parts of the world. Um, and she had, she, she presented this graph that stuck with me. Um, and in this graph, you can see that 55% of the content that's created on the web is created in English. No other language in the entire world uh, will have content more than 6%. This is a, a statistic that you can find uh, on V3 uh, text. Uh, but this is an interesting number, right? So we're, we're basically saying that most of the content, more than half of the content that we're creating, creating is in English. And if we look at a different angle, if we look at a world, not from the perspective of the, the actual content that gets created on the web, but actually from the perspective of the people that are using or are speaking a certain language. You can see here that more than 800 million people are speaking natively Mandarin. So the blue lines there, or the blue bars there, represent the number of people that are speaking natively a, a language. And then the green part is the number of people that are speaking that language as a second language. And this is expressed in millions. So we have here from zero to 1.2 billion people. We can see here that the most used language in the entire world is actually Mandarin. Uh, by far, it has it's been it's spoken by 1.2 billion people. Um, Hindi is another language that is the second most used language, and then English is actually the fourth most used language. Only 350 million people in this entire world speak English natively. So how do we contrast the two? We're creating 50% of the content in English, but that's actually our fourth population in the entire world. And moreover, if we look at the amount of people that are speaking Mandarin and also know English, it's only 10 million in 1.3 billion. We're leaving out a lot of people in this world that might not actually speak English. So there's a huge potential here to create content for a lot of people that don't, don't speak English, don't know English, and it's not their, neither their native uh, language nor their second language. And you might actually be in a place where your product or your company doesn't really need to focus on markets that are outside, that are not using English. But ideally, as the web becomes more and more present in our lives, um, and it becomes one, we become 100% dependent on it, we need to make sure that everyone has access to information on the web. Because otherwise, we are discriminating against a lot of these people. That's not okay. <laughs> so, the V3C, uh, or the V3, uh, website, um, you will be able to find here a couple of quick tips. You'll be able to uh, find um, some of the pointers on how to make sure that your, your website can be accessed and can be interpreted in other languages than the ones that you tradi we traditionally uh, program for. Um, so you will see here um, a couple of things like uh, make sure to encode your content using UTF 
um, and ideally UTF-8. So in 99% of the cases, this will be the right choice. Unless you are programming for specifically for Asian languages, um, UTF-8 will be good enough for us. Um, and basically, um, if the browser and server don't use the same character encoding, uh, then the characters will get corrupted, um, and our application will fill up all those um, those those uh, mismatches with question marks and weird characters. We've all seen that. That happens when the encoding on the web and encoding well, on the client side and on the server side don't match, or whenever our browser doesn't actually support some of the um, encoding um, that needs to. Um, Make sure to always include the encoding into your HTML document and also um, in your, on your server side. Another good thing to remember is that um, you should always specify the, the language that you create the content for. Um, this will be very important um, for accessibility as well, but it also helps with things like search results. Um, so um, user agents will use this or browsers will use this to um, index uh, documents and parse them, but also to suggest translations. Um, so it will use that, um, uh, that attribute to translate con content in a certain language. Another, good to another important topic uh, when we talk about web for all is also accessibility. One billion people, or 15% of the world's population, experience some form of disability. And we're talking here about permanent disability. At any given time or moment, uh, we could become um, differently able as well. Uh, imagine you go skiing, you're having tons of fun, and at some point you break your leg, you break your, heart, your hand, that, that makes you temporarily disabled, right? And you, you, you end up in a place where you have to reconfigure your life for at least one month or two months, depending how bad that was. According to uh, httparchive.org, I highly recommend you check this out. How many of you have, uh, have uh, browsed this, uh, this website? Okay, I can see a couple of hands here. The rest of you, uh, make sure to check it out. It has statistics in regards to the state of JavaScript, the state of web. It gives us information about what's the average, what was the increase in size of, um, of the um, uh, resources that we're downloading over time, uh, how many requests we're making when we're opening a web page on average. And this uses information that's collected across multiple websites. Uh, but in this case, I've looked at accessibility scores. And um, this is using Lighthouse and scores that are, uh, are created by the Lighthouse, which is looking at, like, how many of you have heard of Lighthouse? Wonderful, fantastic. Um, for those of you that haven't, it's basically, you will have it available by default in Chrome Developer Tools, um, and you can, run, you can run audits there to inspect pages to see whether, uh, how good they're performing, uh, what's the SEO, uh, accessibility, and it will also give you information about how progressive is your application. Um, in this case, we're looking at accessibility scores. It goes from zero to 100, and on average, Websites out there are accessible only up to 64%. So many times websites don't have labels for forms, which means that we're not offering context for um, our users, don't have captions for images, which means that we are not creating, the content that we're creating cannot be parsed correctly by screen readers. Um, and there's a lot of other information that we're, uh, we're missing. Um, why is this important? Well, turns out as web becomes more and more uh, relevant in our lives, um, sometimes we might end up um, having to pay our bills using websites, um, having to pay our taxes using websites. And if we go ahead and profile websites, uh, we'll, we might see that actually um, they're, not, they're not accessible by, um, by screen readers. They cannot be interpreted. Um, some of the... Um, metrics used here are buttons do not have an accessible name. You know, for, for screen readers to correctly spell the, um, the elements on the page, they have to have a name that uh, declares the intention. Image elements do not have alt attribute. 
that's the caption for an image and that's what um, describes whatever images is out there. Imagine if you didn't have any, you couldn't see that information. You would just hear that there's an image here and nobody would tell you what kind of image is that. That would be huge FOMO, right? <laughs> um, and this is just being very um, superficial about this information on my side. Uh, form elements do not have associated labels. Uh, we've come to this place where we're creating a lot of forms um, which don't, which are very minim minimal, focused on minimalism, which is great. We love minimalism, but at the same time, we don't have enough information that creates context for our users. And finally, links do not have a discernible name. You click on something, but actually you don't have any text there. You have no idea what's happening there. Um, the, the V3 website also has a couple of uh, quick tips here for us um, that basically uh, give us guidance um, on how to create uh, websites that are perceivable, basically create context for images, for text, uh, for audio and video. Uh, operable, um, make sure that you, you can navigate using keyboards, um, understandable and uh, robust. Um, and Microsoft has created this inclusive design website where you're going to be able to find some uh, booklets and some quick tips on how to design your website with uh, diversity and inclusion in mind. And there's also a wonderful session uh, by Alex Moldovan. Uh, he's going to be in this room from 1210 to 1250, um, and he's going to dive into some of these details. I've only given you a couple of ideas and an overview, but he's going to um, dive much deeper into that. What about web on everything? According to uh, Statista, basically in 2009, only 0.6% of the web traffic was accessed from a mobile phone or a mobile device. We've grown in less than 10 years um, in a way that now 52% of the web traffic actually comes from, web from mobile devices. That's huge, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't refer only to our phones. Now we can, you can access the web from your tablet. Uh, you can access it from um, an IoT device. You can access it from your fridge, if that's something that's interesting for you. Uh, but the more important thing here is that we have to always have in mind these numbers when we're creating websites, because these different devices, they have different capabilities. They, ha they can access different internet speeds. They have different um, screen sizes. And when we're building websites, most of the times we tend to test them on our, on our desktop, on our PC, and that's ideal. You have good Wi-Fi, you have a huge screen, everything looks wonderful, but what happens when the screen shrinks or when you're on t 2G as opposed to, um, to 5G or 4G? So one of the concepts or one of the technologies that, um, will, that aims to solve some of those problems is the progressive web applications. How many of you have heard of progressive web applications? Fantastic, half of the room. How many of you have actually built a progressive web app? Okay, that's great. Um, I'm happy to see that. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the concept, basically progressive web applications are web applications um, that are regular web pages or websites, but they can appear to the user like traditional applications uh, or native mobile applications. That means that you can access that application from your device, from your home screen device. Um, it will um, open in a full screen type of um, environment and it will offer you transitions that are very similar to the ones that you encounter in a native application. Another definition that I absolutely love um, comes from Alex Russell. They're just websites that took all the right vitamins. <laughs> uh, Alex Russell and with his wife Frances, uh, they actually coined the progressive web apps term while they were uh, having dinner, just like every couple of software engineers out there that <laughs> go out for dinner and talk about programming and what they've done at work. Um, and they come up with, uh, with this list of 10 things that make an application progressive. 
Um, and they mention things like it has to be discoverable. One of the best attributes of the web is the fact that you can Google something, you can search for something, and you'll have a URL, um, and that URL is also linkable. Um, another thing that's important about progressive web apps is that it it's app-like, which makes it look native. Um, it's responsive, makes it look, look nice on different device sizes. Um, it's, uh, it's also one of the things that we care about a lot is connectivity independent. How many of you have been in a situation where you are reading something very important, um, you ran out of internet because you're in a plane or in a train or somewhere where um, under a bridge or something, um, and you no longer have internet, your connection has died, and you don't have access to um, your information anymore. That's terrible, right? Um, and progressive web apps um, help us cache that information and always have at least one version of the application uh, that you can still access. So how do we make this happen? Basically, we have this concept of baseline happiness, uh, which uses three main things. The first one is service workers. So service workers will intercept all the requests that we're making over the wire, um, and that's where we can decide whether we're serving um, um, content that comes from, from the server, from the backend server, or we're serving cached information. Um, Web manifest, that's what tells our browser um, wh wh how does, what kind of icon we can use in order to save our application on home screen. And it basically informs our browser that this is a progressive web app. Um, and then everything needs to be uh, served over HTTPS. Uh, this is very important because um, service workers are extremely powerful. We can override data that is being returned or that is being shown on a, on a web page. So we want to make sure that we avoid the man in the middle attack. And that's why we're using HTTPS. Uh, there's going to be a, a talk today at 12.50 in the same room by Radu, uh, progressive web applications, the why, the what, and how. Make sure, if you're interested in the topic, make sure to check out this session. All right, so we've looked at some of, like, how did the web start? We've looked at some of the principles that are super important for the web from the beginning up until now. Um, but what gets us excited for the future and what's next for us? This was the initial page. We've seen it before. A collection of text and links, nothing very interactive. Um, and that's what JavaScript helped us with. It helped us bring behavior and bring interactivity and animations and wonderful experiences to the, to the web. And as we started working with more and more frameworks on the front end, we realized that actually we can port and we can bring a lot of the code and a lot of the logic, we can bring it to the client. We no longer have to use the backend and rely on the backend to implement everything. We can implement a lot of that um, in the client, on the client side using JavaScript. But that also came with some performance issues. That also came with some hacks, probably. Um, so then, uh, this is when browser creators um, started looking at how can we optimize JavaScript. Um, and they came up with this thing called just-in-time um, uh, compilation, where we are looking at uh, optimizing some of the um, code that is executed uh, constantly. So if, if, you, if, if our um, uh, engine, like V8, uh, will see that we are executing the same uh, lines of code multiple times, they're basically going to optimize those executions by, um, by transpiling that into machine code and using directly the machine code as opposed to interpreting JavaScript. That's one thing that I was supposed to mention, which is that JavaScript is interpreted um, as opposed to compiled languages. Um, and as multiple browsers were doing this, in 2017, uh, they all agreed to this minimal viable pro uh, product for WebAssembly, um, or WASM for short. And WebAssembly is not designed to be written by hand, and it's not intended to be understood by humans. Um, 
When code is compiled to WebAssembly, the resulting bytecode is represented in a binary format rather than a text format, which reduces the file size, allowing it to be transmitted and downloaded fast. Now you're probably questioning, what is this thing, WebAssembly, Simona? What are you talking about? Well, here's a definition for you. <laughs> WebAssembly, abbreviated WASM, uh, is a binary instruction format for a stacked-based virtual machine. And WASM is designed as a portable target for compilation of high-level languages like C, C++, Rust. Um, and if you've watched Microsoft Build, you've probably noticed that um, there's support for .NET as well, um, enabling deployment on the web for client and server applications. This is a definition coming from WebAssembly.org. Um, you'll also find another one on developer.mozilla.org. Org. So th these are two places where you can find good documentation for WebAssembly. Uh, but the one that I really like is this one coming from v3.org, which is we make Rocket go faster. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, but if we look at all these definitions, there's three things that stand out. First of all, the fact that we can write code in different languages and run it in WebAssembly in the browser alongside JavaScript. So we can write code in C, C++, Rust.net. Uh, there's other languages that have um, created experimental support, like, for example, Kotlin. Um, portable, uh, we can run these applications on any device in any browser. Um, and then they're also fast. Because we are looking at machine code, binary code, that can be downloaded, it has a, an optimized size, uh, and it's immediately starting to run, uh, we're looking at fast applications. Another cool thing about WebAssembly is that um, it's, not, it's not only the fact that we can write code in C++ and then deploy it on the web, but we can also reuse some of the, uh, some of the existing libraries alongside, li alongside JavaScript. So imagine you've written a library 15 years ago, and now you can compile that library into WebAssembly and reuse it in your web applications. That's super powerful. That's not reinventing the wheel, which is great. And as I mentioned, you can run, like there's a lot of articles out there that, that are saying that WebAssembly is gonna kill JavaScript. That is not true. There's always going to be JavaScript developers. There's always going to be C, C++ developers. And we're gonna work together towards creating a much better web. Um, so WebAssembly loves JavaScript. And there's, there's a lot of um, work towards integrating both of them through modules uh, and making sure that you can call uh, code from JavaScript into WebAssembly and the other way around. So basically what this enables us is um, it brings the web for all developers. So we have web for everyone, web on everything, and web for all developers, which are the creators of the web. <laughs> so now we're addressing the elephant in the room, right? Everyone is working with React, Angular, and everyone is kind of uh, having this debate whether you should use one or another, and then whether you should use plain JavaScript or you should use frameworks. But actually, we are also super interested about machine learning, right? That gets us excited as well. And machine learning is the process of teaching a computer to come up with its own answers by showing it a lot of examples, feeding it a lot of data, instead of giving it a set of rules to follow. In traditional programming, we tend to use a lot of ILF else. So if you wanted to maybe distinguish whether a picture has a cat or not, we're gonna have to um, analyze a lot of the bytes that are in that image, and then we can decide whether that's true by having tons of if else. With machine learning, we just feed it an image, and then it's gonna return the uh, data that it can recognize based on other data that we've fed in the past. And let's see if this works. Who's seen this before? Wonderful. This is a doodle that has been uh, created by Google uh, to celebrate the German composer and musician, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And it's the very first AI-powered doodle. Google has
has used 306 Bach compositions in order to um, generate new music. We all liked it. <laughs> uh, you're going to be able to find this by, um, if you search for doodles celebrating Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, this was all possible because of this library that has been created in 2017, TensorFlow, uh, 2018, TensorFlow.js, uh, which is a JavaScript library for training and deploying machine learning models in the browser and on Node.js. Um, and the cool thing about TensorFlow.js is that it's not a wrapper on top of the existing TensorFlow uh, library written in uh, CC++. Um, it's, it's actually a re-implementation, a rewrite uh, in JavaScript, which means that you can directly import this in your page using the script tag or you can install the library using NPM without having to install any of the native uh, modules. And then this is uh, an example of a hello world application where we initialize a model, we train it with um, some given data, those are some random arrays, um, and then we can predict some random numbers, we can generate some random numbers on existing data that has been created. This is one example where you can see how you can train, create and train models in the browser. But sometimes that is not enough. Sometimes we are, in, in that case, we are reusing the browser capabilities. And it's great because it gives us privacy for our data. It, uh, we can have it run only in the, in the browser. But sometimes that's not enough. And we might want to train on by, like terabytes of data. Um, and the cloud can help us with that. That usually takes days. Um, so what we can do using TensorFlow.js, we can basically use models that have been created, that have been trained in the cloud for us. Uh, we can import them in our application, and then we can predict uh, data using those models. Obviously, if that model is absolutely ginormous, that means that um, the experience that our users is going to have is not great. So then there's another option, which is use third-party um, APIs. This is a... Um, this is an application that has been created by my colleague, uh, Sarah Dresner. Uh, she basically used the custom vision API from Microsoft Cognitive Services to uh, send the message, and then the Cognitive Services API uses um, millions of images that has parsed in the past, and it generates captions for these images. Um, we can see here that the caption for this is Grace Hopper wearing a hat. Um, that's a full sentence making sense for everyone. Uh, if you're looking for more examples of uh, how to use TensorFlow.js, um, Asim and Eleanor have created this um, website called AIJS.rocks. Uh, you're going to be able to find here uh, details about the implementation of all these libraries um, and the source code as well as some demos, uh, very interesting demos. But what I want you to remember is that TensorFlow.js will help you with uh, machine learning in the browser. Um, you can also use machine learning as a service when um, you actually need to process more and more data. Um, and then, very important, the example I gave you there was um, using machine learning to generate captions for data. So we can use machine learning for good. We can use machine learning to help us with some of the accessibility um, initiatives that we have when building our applications. So yeah, I hope this was an interesting um, presentation where you got to see some of the history of the web and celebrate um, what we've come to accomplish on the web and how dependent we became on the web. And you're excited about building more and more applications uh, that will solve more and more interesting problems. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a with a uh, video that you're absolutely gonna uh, love, and hopefully you're gonna have a fantastic rest of the of the conference of the day. <laughs> okay, so let's see if this works. Who recognizes this person?
David Bowie, for those of you that don't. Now that, what, how dare he claim like that? Absolute bullshit. No, you see, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. End. I don't agree. I think the internet. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool, though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. No, it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, when you think then about the Is there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But yeah. that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment. Whether Thank you so much. Thank you.